has. Walter makes a run ahead of it. Burkamp suddenly changed pace through the centre. It's Burkamp! That's magnificent! The move, and then this, which left Dabby's ass totally stranded. Hello, and welcome to a Bird Camp Wonderland, the podcast where they keep podcasting no matter what. Even when we're on a run of seven wins, no emergency podcast just yet. Just yet, give it time. The crumble will come. With me tonight to talk about the arse, it's, uh, well, let's start at the top right-hand corner. It's the man with uh, magical fingers. He's been he's been growing and bedding and kneading and planting. It's the man who's on gardening leave. He's now back. How's your garden looking, uh, Josh? Because you've had quite some time, haven't you, you cheeky monkey? I mean, just look to my left. Look at this. Look at this. It's fabulous. That, that was a shrubbery right, last uh, time I saw you. Now look at it. <laughs> it wasn't even there. Look at it. Um, Guy the Monstera, he's an absolute unit now he's enjoying it um there's even one leaf i don't think anyone would be able to get it actually maybe thunder road because i know what he's like right down there for some reason he's grown a leaf upside down i don't know why there's obviously a light source down there or he's well what can i say i've a creating light from who knows where but yeah it's great to be back non-conformist and, uh... plants there's nothing <laughs> worse yeah exactly it's... A little update on the other people on gardening leave. Carl is uh, still dealing with stuff and he will be back. And uh, we're all still in the group together. We all chit chat, well, apart from Chris. And uh, um, spoke to John the other day. And John is still dealing with personal stuff as well. But Josh is over his and he's back permanently now, which is good. And I spoke uh, to Chris yesterday as well. And oh, today. Me. How? I know. How? Um, through, through message in a bottle. Message in a bottle. That was it. No. Um... We were chatting about Arsenal shirts, of course. As he, yeah, he's having a fire sale at the moment. If anyone is after uh, every Arsenal shirt ever in medium size, go to Chris's Twitter, KC underscore runs, mm-hmm. something like that. And he's selling yeah. them all. He's is just he... got the night. No, he's just got the last few seasons left now. All the rest he's have got... gone. All the old ones went to. Um, oh, actually, Mark. Oh, wait, say, yeah. Mark oh, I'm just guessing. Yeah. Yeah, you got them. I Excellent. Know, including so, the one I'd asked for, but uh, that's Chris oh, for you. Well, that is Chris for you. <laughs> um, also, here is the uh, bloody hell, there's 40 people watching on, 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 on Twitter. Hello, you beautiful bastards. If you're watching on Twitter, you can type in underneath the, the video that you're watching that you can see the type. You can type in there and it will pop up on the screen when I highlight it. So, thank you very much. 47 people now. Jeez, it's getting worse. Richard. How have you been? You've rushed home from either work or training the, the girls' team or one or the other. Which one was it and how are you? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> work and uh, the youngest daughter's um, parents' teacher evening. That, that that was too many words. I, I think I'm confused. What are you drinking? Because yeah. you're a fellow Pepsi Max fan. I'm on the Pepsi Max. I can design. I am. Unfortunately, though, I'm, I'm, I've gone rogue and I've got, I've got a can of cherry aid. Get that right in the bin. I've also got a bottle of water. Talking about a man who loves his drinks, it's only Melvin. Two shows in a row, Melvin. How are you doing? Not too bad. I'm I'm, uh, getting a bit nervous. I've taken two glasses of water tonight, not just one. Two? Two, yeah. I thought I'd uh, try it, see how it goes. I bet you're no stranger to a champagne bar back in the day. (laughs) Yeah, I used to serve them. (laughs) serve them cheeky so uh yeah it's been a good another a good week for the gooners uh we have continued our run our almost i think it is arteta's best run i think the previous best run of consecutive wins was six he's now done seven brentford will make it eight but josh you haven't been here for a while i'll give you a really simple question what happened and when did it happen and what has caused this amazing run and how much longer can it continue well for those that know main thing that's occurring is that Ellis isn't watching us play he uh every time he watches us play we lose um and that goes all the way back to I think even Champions League Porto game first game we watched in ages lost 1-0 so it's mainly Ellis's fault but I probably also looked at that pre-season not pre-season 
winter break that we had. There's obviously something happened there, regrouped as a team. And I think that settled back four has really helped. So Kivior has really grown into it. Obviously, the English lessons have um, helped. We know that when he came in, that was one of the struggles he had initially was the communication. And you know we need that in the back four. And I think he's been one of the revelations this season um, in terms of, I think initially we thought Timber would be the player that would come in. Obviously, he had the setback. Zinchenko, again, has shown to be a bit ropey with fitness. Uh, Tommy Asu, I think, Danny, as you've joked, is uh, ready to go and get injured on international duty. And yeah, I think Kivior coming in has really, really helped us in that regard. And then obviously finding that balance in midfield. Uh, I think we've been a little bit loose, should we say? And Jorginho has looked to be, again, another very astute purchase, what, over just over a year now he's been at the club. And hopefully, uh, I think we're talking about extensions. So, yeah, that's where I think it's it's coming from. I'd look to start at that defence. And obviously, Saka's having a superb season. Martin Odegaard looks to be one of the best playmakers in the Premier League, maybe even the world right now, in terms of what he's doing for the team. So, yeah, I think overall, we're just absolutely firing on all cylinders. And the good thing that's really helping us is we're not being lucky when we're doing this. This is through our own hard work and effort, not like a a team up in the Northwest who seem to be getting through by hook or by crook right now. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it's really nice to see that <coughs> we're doing really well um, through our own work ethic. You mentioned Ellis there. I forgot to say Ellis. There's nothing actually wrong with Ellis. He is, he is if you didn't know, <laughs> he's, uh, he's head of A&E at a hospital, kind of. And he's working shift, 24-hour shift, a year, month after day after week, plus three kids. And he's really busy. He'll be back one day when they fire him or he has, he has a breakdown from working so many hours. But the poor lad, that's where we I think that's. I think I've covered it. Oh, and Jeff Arsenal. I messaged him and he said maybe next week. So there you go. Uh, all the, the gardening leave and MIA, uh, they are all accounted for. I forgot to say hello to people. Phil Macker is there. Super. Hello. Paul Nell. Avon is here. You mentioned um, uh, who was the one you mentioned about the plant, Josh? You said he, he might be Thunder Road. Thunder God Road. knows where he is. Haven't seen him in months. Well, hopefully my return has got him out of the gutter. Well, hopefully, Rudy. Hello, Rudy. Uh, who else is there? That's me. Ah, oh, Colin Addy. Hello, Colin. Um, Hente. Ah, oh, hello. The Arsenal statistician about to go to bed here in Finland. But in this calendar year, Arsenal will have played 11 matches till Porto on March the 12th. That's ev- that's a game every 6.5 days. And then the second part of his thing is from City, from City on the Gunners would play 13 in 50 days to Everton if we're going all the way to the Champions League. That's a game every 3.8 days that's a whole new ball game ahead that is going to be hard mm-hmm. rich um we, we've uh, do you want to talk a little bit about where this run of form has come or have, have we come yeah. back to well, I, th- I think i think um josh has, has covered it covered it all really um and very very well i say that that trip to dubai has um has done wonders i say the settle back four i think he covered it very very well i don't think there's really much more for me to add on on that um i think the the only other thing i would say is, is we we're, we're we're playing just as well as we were um, earlier in the season, but we're now taking our chances. We're, we're being a little bit more, more, more clinical. You know, you think back to those, those frustrating games like against West Ham, against Aston Villa, where mate, we could, could not put the ball in the back of the net despite loads and loads of chances. But now we're 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 sticking them away, and I think that's the the main difference is 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 uh, Martinelli, Saka, and and Co coming to the party with uh, with goals. But yeah, no, Josh Josh summed it up perfectly, mate. Mm. Melvin, would you like to have a little bit of a say on that because uh, you've been watching for many more years than most of us, and that is one hell of a run, isn't it? We, I said on the last podcast, I think the best ever was George um, uh, was Wenger with uh, the last fourteen games of the Invincible season, I think it was, and then George Graham's best was ten, and uh, uh, and Emery's best was I think eight at the beginning of that season, so he's on seven already. Um, what do you put it down to and how much further do you reckon we can go if I move on to the next one with the next games, Brentford at home, Man City away? Is that where it could all end up going wrong? 
Well, that would define how good a team we really are. Obviously, not just if we beat them, but yeah. how we go, how we take them on. I mean, normally when you play Man City away, you're watching it through your fingers, aren't you? And uh, that is not going to happen this time. I want us to take the game to City. I want us to sh to have as much possession of the ball against City as we would have done or have done, say, at the Emirates the last few seasons. But just to go back to Richard's point about winning all those games and, it, and we've been playing well like, and we just couldn't put the ball in it earlier, I think we've been playing differently. I really do. Because I remember sitting there and watching us give the ball to our right back, to our left back, to our centre half. We don't do that anymore. It's we ping it about. I mean, it's 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 like when you, you do training, you're only allowed to touch the ball once in certain periods of the game. It sees you're not allowed to touch it more than once. Otherwise, uh, you've got to give the ball to the, the opposition. We played some amazing, amazing football. It can go on. Obviously, we I think we can be. This is the most I've ever been confident about beat. I'm not saying we will. Who knows? I'm not a, I'm not a fortune teller. But this is the most confident I've been away to one of the top top teams that we can actually that we will could win it could could win it, and if we beat if big word in life if we beat City then I think all of a sudden the pressure will be on us because everyone will go well they're going to win it now we haven't had the pressure on us we've been the underdogs this season because of our before the way we uh, played before December but now just watching us we can actually when we watch us sit back. And not sweat. We're just sitting there and enjoying it. It's like watching a film. You know you're going to see the end of it, and you'll be fine. You know it's fine. But, you know, watching Arsenal beginning of the season, it was bit. It was very. Uh, can we hold on against some of the lower teams at home? We were holding on the last few minutes, but now we just blow them away. And we've got to get. We mustn't show Man City too much respect when we play. We've got to get over Brentford first. Obviously, we couldn't beat them last season. But I think that old cliche, isn't it? But let's get Brentford done and then we'll talk about the next one. And then we'll talk about the next one. And then we'll talk about the next <laughs> one. That's why I see it anyway. Probably the best way to go. Josh, next game, Brentford. Ramsdale is getting his first game in goal since uh, PSV on the 12th of December. Three months without playing a game. Is that going to be a problem for him? Uh, I'm not sure, really. Um, you know, we don't always like to see a goalkeeper coming cold. Uh, but I think the thing that would help in this situation is that we've known when you see the fixture list that this is going to be a game that David Raya cannot play as opposed to him being injured or suspended or whatever, something that would happen in you know, the days before the fixture. So I imagine that Ramsdale's been training with this group again um, rather than being in the, you know, what, the second 11 and training with that back four. So hopefully it doesn't make um, too much of a difference. I know that um, from what we've seen, that the team is settled defensively. We're not giving up too much. My hope is that continues. Ramsdale then has a very quiet afternoon. Um, but there is that, um, I think the way that I'd expect it going forward, we'll still be blowing teams away. The worry might be for Brentford is them on the counter-attack. Um, and if we maybe give up one or two goals, so it's more about whether or not we keep a clean sheet is how I'm thinking. I'm not really thinking it affects the end result. Oh, Hente's been nice there. It's just nice to hear you again, Josh. Last time I heard you was at the Highbury squad. Oh, I saw you bum licking the Highbury squad the other day. <laughs> I miss you guys. <laughs> Scalping well, for work. They, they're not no, interested maybe. in you. They, they've moved on from the likes of you. It's, oh, I'm uh, too big for them now, is that it? Well... That, that's it. Yeah, you got you got you got your shrubbery behind you. It's like watching yeah. the Drogner game. That's that's the adventure game. That's that's one for the kids. Um, Rich, the uh, that Brentford game that they got um, again. Luca Tony. It's not Luca Tony. Oh, that's in my brain forever now. I'm never getting rid of it. Ivan Tony. He's. Uh, I think he's played four games, scored three goals. He's looked pretty decent. We've got a goalkeeper that is uh, a little bit rusty because no matter how much you play in in training and that lot, it doesn't make you match fit. And we know it, if there's a pigeon anywhere near Ramsdale in the first twenty minutes, we're done for, aren't we? Because he's going to be distracted. <laughs> well, I, hopefully not. Like I say, it's 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 not ideal not having that game time in in quite a long time, especially for someone a position like a goalkeeper or 
you know, <clears throat> and especially one of those positions where you're not um, expected to be in action for long periods. And then you've got to be switched on. Your concentration needs to be up there. Um, the, the biggest difference, I, I think, that you have for me when um, uh, between Ramsdale and Raya is um, well, two things about apart from me, you know, his, his high catching ability of Raya is his starting position off of the uh, defensive line. So, like when the when Saliba and Gabriel push up high, I think I've mentioned this in the football pause, David Ra- David Raya plays quite high, whereas Ramsdale doesn't as much. Uh, and we're in the back end of last season, we kept on getting done by that balls over the top of of Saliba and and Gabriel into that big gap and we have to turn and run back towards our own goal. Whereas Raya was is more likely to be a little bit higher and negates that kind of um that option for them. Um that being said, they uh, it, they are fairly certain in Buemo's not fit yet for them. Um, which is a big, big um, loss for them, and because he, he's he's got he's fabulous footballer and he's got pace to burn. Um, hopefully, um, you know Saliba and and um, Gabriel have, uh, can relish that duel against Tony and 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 try and neutralise him as best as they can. And, and the fact that they've got so many defensive people missing as well, like, um, I think that Pinnock is missing, I believe, and Nico Henry and stuff like that. So hopefully, let's like say we we just press them and we just don't let them out of a, um out of their their box. A bit like what we did to Newcastle, a bit like what we did to Sheffield United, and almost to where Ramsdale becomes irrelevant almost um, towards it. So hopefully, let's say it, it goes towards that because I say if if we if we don't start from the off like we did against um, Newcastle and, uh, and we did against Sheffield United, and I have no reason to think why we wouldn't. Um, then, like I said, them them high balls up in over the top or up to um, the physicality of Tony, you know, might be able to cause us, uh, problems. But I've got massive faith in um, in Gabriel and and Saliba to to deal with what the Brentford are going to bring. Famous last words. I I, I think that uh, it's going to be a slightly different game. And where we're playing at the moment, whoever plays centre forward or striker for the other team doesn't get the ball. They don't get a chance to put a ball through. The amount of times in the Sheffield United game and the Burnley game, they were just clearing it away from their box. It was going anywhere. So it's not like precision football, the other team. We're not allowing the other teams to play football. We're suffocating mm. them from the front. So, and Tony, we've got two centre-halves. He can't do it by himself. They'll have to lead him up there by himself. They cannot afford to have Ivan Tony and another football, whoever it is, up front with him while we've got the ball. And we'll have the ball, obviously, most of the game. So I think that nullifies them big time. And we just got to keep playing it around like we have, get behind them. We, It's it's wonderful to watch. We're hitting them, people from every type of angle. It's uh, it's very difficult to defend the game, especially when we're playing it so fast. It's you've got to, I've had to concentrate sometimes to see what's going on. I mean, the other night, watching it on the box, I saw this guy in midfield. I didn't recognise him. And it was white because he'd never seen him in midfield before. I thought, who's that player? He's a bit too too tall for Jorginho. What's happened there? Have we brought someone he, on? Then I realised he's been, white. He's been stepping into that position ever since, yeah. like, say, zinchenko has gone and we've got Kivio who sits a little bit more. We've kind of alternated that midfield access into the right white pushes into there a little bit more and just and flip that access just, a, just that little bit. And again, like I say... If we if we if we're direct and we keep that ball and we let's say we keep moving, we've got Jorginho in there as well to pull them strings. And like I said, I I, I I'm I'm with you. I, I'm, and that's not me being arrogant or no, negating no. what Brentford because Brentford uh, and Thomas Franks as as they play some really really good football. But I just I think they've got too many injuries and we are in too good form and we are playing too confident for for them to stop us. Yeah, it's amazing how far. Um... We, we kind of come as a team that what one two seasons ago we'd have been like oh Neil Mopay's in the team he's going to cause us some problems in terms of winding up our players or you know getting in those players heads and you just look at it now and we're just like well we've not even mentioned players like that or the team getting affected by that kind of uh, shithousery we're just a lot better um, than that generally <laughs> and I think it's amazing that 
that's the transformation we've seen that we're only talking about us being on the front foot there is no thought about the opposition which is back into the heyday of <clears throat> excuse me Wenger when he would go it doesn't really matter what the opposition is doing we know what we're doing and we're going to win that way and it is as you say Rich it's only arrogance if we don't pull it off but we're <clears> pulling <throat> it off at the moment so that's just confidence and yeah, I just, and that I think... and that just transition that just transitions into fear for the the opposition. Then fear us. So that means that you know that defender, that midfielder, he's not going to step onto us. He, they're not going to they're going to wear be wary to to step off the line and go and cl- try and close stuff down because of, they're fearful of leaving space behind us. And if they sit off us, I know, like I say, it's a you know you, we we had a few issues with with you know breaking down teams. Um, in, a, in a low block, you know, prior to, to Christmas and stuff like that a little bit. But I said, they said we got that speed and we they've got that fear factor. Like I said, the, the the fear factor, we scored like, what is it, 31 goals or something silly like that in the in the league since January? You know, um, they've, they've the fear that they've got is now going to pen them back. And like I said, if we just keep that ball and we keep moving, don't get panicky, don't get things, don't try to, like I say, if it, if it doesn't come in the first 15 minutes, that's fine but we just keep playing our game and keep pressing them and don't let them out. And just sooner or later, that egg will crack. Also, Richard, what's the difference as well, I think, is that we away from home, this makes the difference more than at home. We don't get bullied. We could have mm, played yeah. Burnley, Sheffield United, they try and kick us off the park. That can't happen anymore. We are a much stronger physical team than we've been the last, what, seven, eight years. So that, that's mentality as well. You go out there thinking they're not going to bully us. Let's just play football. And that makes a very did, big difference. As well. That's the big did one. You guys see that, it, isn't it? Yeah, that's another thing. I was just say, did you guys see that that image of the lads in the in the yeah, tunnel? tunnel. Yeah. And they're all turning as cold as ice. They're ready for that. <laughs> and it's say like, I was absolutely and that's what I say, you make a great point. And we, with Havertz as well, him being, you know, he might not be winning every header that goes up to him, but he's making a noose of himself. He's putting himself about and he's got the technical ability that when he does win a ball or get the ball closer, that he can, you know, play other people in. But like I said, we're not getting getting bullied off the ball anymore. You know, again, touch word, I don't want to jinx it. Don't so that's, a, I say, another great shout. We're, we're, we're a team of men now. It's not like, you know, you used to, you know, you used to be all the joke with men against boys kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But this is a team full of men. And when you've mentioned Havertz, so, sorry, Jojo. Yeah, go for it. He closes down people as mm. as well, if not better than Odegaard. You mm. see the way he closes down their defence. He's amazing. He just stops them from playing. And also, which I've noticed about him, and I'm, is what a transformation that's been the last few months. But you, you look at the game, you go, oh, what a shame you can't see him running on the outside. He's looking the wrong way. He sees them. He's got an awareness of all the players around him and he gives that ball. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this. What a player he's become. He's really he's, integral to our team. He looks like the player that had all of that confidence when Chelsea bought him. Yeah. And we've. I think that's the great thing that we've been able to do is bring players that... Martin Odegaard is one of them as well. At Real Madrid, was a shadow of the player that initially was thought to be bursting on the scene. And bring him in... And the work that we've done to rehabilitate him has been superb. And again, Kai Havertz, it just looks like maybe there's the kind of whispers of do we even need to look for a central forward in the summer Mm. because of the work that Kai Havertz is doing right now. And maybe we look for another midfielder to kind of, I think initially when I thought Kai Havertz was coming in, he was to take that Xhaka role. But now it looks like actually... We could do with another player in there, in that midfield. You know, Jorginho's not getting any younger, uh, but looks integral right now. It's a player that goes in there. And the work that Havertz is doing, as you say, Melvin, he looks far more intimidating than our forward line has looked when he's closing you down. And that's partly down to his stature. You know, yeah. Gabby Jesus is ferocious when he's chasing you, but what, he's five foot nine, five foot eight? Whereas you've got six foot four. Kai Havertz coming at you, the hits of where you think the ball could go as a defender, you just you just can't do it. It's just far more intimidating, and it's really made us a difficult team to play against. 
when you talk about Jorginho not getting any younger, that, that obviously is true. But he's getting yeah. better. He's he playing. Is, yeah. big. He is not the player that played for Chelsea either. You're talking mm -hmm. about Havertz yeah. not being the player. Mm -hmm. There's been a big change. I don't know what it is, but he is now. You, when you you see him, is he plays some? Like go back he, what, six mm -hmm. months. You go, oh, what a shame. So and so's not playing. We got mm -hmm. Jorginho. Now you're going. I want Jorginho there. I want him there. Big change. I think because because he, he's got short spaces around him. He's got Declan Rice who can be his legs. And also, you've got that short distance between him and the centre-backs. I don't want to keep harking on about, that, say, David Raya, but because David Raya can play so high, which means that defence can then push up even higher, and it just tightens and closes down that space. You know, that was always one of the things that was an issue with Xhaka, was Xhaka's mobility over after 10, 15 yards in these big open spaces, playing basketball football under Emery, it, it, it made him look terrible and it was disastrous for him. And I think the same would be of Jorginho in, in that system. But you tighten everything up, small spaces. That guy has got the, the he's got the nous, he's got the touch, he's got the brain. Everything's three seconds faster uh, in his brain and he's just, he's excelling in it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully he doesn't bugger off back to Italy because we've seen historically in Italy all the great players, be it Ruud Hulli, Lota Mateus, all these players are attacking quality midfielders and the older they get, the further back they drop and then they end up being the one that covers the back four. And uh, Jorginho has been doing that for us for the last two or three seasons and he's only, what, 31? Playing the way he does, he could have the next five or six years at Arsenal. And we've seen um, uh, matey boy at um, the centre-back at Chelsea doing it, um, players in Italy. I mean, if he goes to Italy, he'll still be able to do this job at the age of 45. It takes very little movement or anything <laughs> to be able to do that. And it is <clears throat> and it is genius by Arteta, because I moaned about Jorginho, but I said I loved him when he was playing in Italy. Mm. And then I, we all moaned about Kai Havertz. But Josh, with the Kai Havertz thing, uh, has Arteta fallen onto this playing him as the false nine when, when without a striker because he's played him at the left eight, right eight. He's, he's played him on the, a little bit on the wing, which is what he made his name when he was playing in Germany. Um, recently, Germany played him at left back and now he's then he's played him up front on his own and that hasn't worked. So is it just a matter of going, it's a little bit like playing that mastermind game where you've got one peg in the right position and two in the wrong colour? Is it is it a little bit like that? Has he fallen on this or was this just his plan? Remember in the days, because Wenger used to get strikers to play out wide so they knew what to expect from as uh, from their players. And has, has he done that with him, do you think? Or was it just... I think luck? when you're talking about the positions that Havertz has played for us, it's clearly a key role in the build-up somewhere. That's what Arteta's looked at. In left eight, he clearly thought that he would be a pivot for players to run off and a conduit for the build-up play. Again, same where he's playing now. What the Havertz is allowing to do is give that space for the players that we want to see and we know um, have got the shooting boots that we really want. So Martinelli, I know he's having a indifferent season at the moment. I think he's the one player in the squad that really misses Granit Xhaka not being um, in the side anymore because he would be the player that was playing him in constantly in behind. And we just don't have that right now. But Saka, there's a reason why he's playing, what, he's having another absurd season for a player of his relative age. He is one of the best right-wingers in the world right now, based on form and performance. And I think that's, that's the big thing that Havertz is allowing. He's clearly, you could see that Arteta knew that Havertz would unlock part of this team when we're attacking but I think potentially what he's had to work out was where exactly that position was to really make us sing and I think it's to the point where we're now looking at the fact of do we want to see Jesus up front anymore or do we now want to see Jesus out on the left maybe partly due to Martinelli's form but Havertz seems almost undroppable I would say right now yeah, Rich, what do you think about that? The, uh, the, the Are the days of um, hey, who's playing as the number nine in a formation where we could never get... Remember in the days of uh, Song playing as DM, always playing everywhere apart from DM. Like, Jesus, you very... I mean, it, sometimes you, you do a Sanchez and be running back to the defence to get the ball or to do covering, which we don't really want to see. So do you think you'd be better off using him on the wings? 
Um, I, I think it'll be like a, a bit of a horses for courses kind of thing with him. Um, you know, there, there's no there's no reason why you have to play uh, Jesus up um, in that number nine up front down the middle. I so said he's he, he did it enough for Brazil and uh, and Man City down on the right or even on the left and stuff like that. He's there's still a, a, a there's still there's still places and minutes for him in this team. Um, you know, as as great and fantastic as as um, uh, Havertz has been and and is, you know. So let's not forget how transformational J- Gabby Jesus was for us when he first came into that side. You know, his close control and even uh, in being five foot nine, his ability to win the ball and hold the ball up is actually quite staggering for a guy of, of, of his size. So, I, you know, and sometimes we can get a little bit, um, you know, the the uh, sometimes, let say, the player who's not playing is, is, you know, can either be the best thing since sliced bread or we don't need him anymore. But we, we definitely need him in this side. He brings he brings something else that, that you know, a bit of pace and intensity that Havertz might not always bring. You know, a bit, a bit of flair, a bit, of, a bit of close control, and 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 you know that ability to take on players out in the wide channels and stuff like that. You know, just before he he went out, I say, he, um, I know, he, I think he missed it, um, um, a, a good chance as well. But he scored two very, very good goals against Nottingham Forest, and he was our best player before he went out injured. So, I, I think there's still a place for for um, for uh, Gabriel Jesus, but I think. With Hazard's Havertz emergence and and form in that centre, you know, I I then think that it doesn't necessarily mean that Jesus has to play in that middle zone. You know, you've got like I said, if if Martinelli's not feeling it or it, you've got that that he can play on on that side in in Martinelli's spot. Or you know, if you want to if you want to rest um, Saka because we don't really have much cover on that right hand side you know he can fill in and, and do a very very good job there he did it in title winning seasons at, at, at a City there so why couldn't he do a job I, th- I don't think we need to throw the baby out of the bath water on, on Gabriel Jesus I think he's definitely got um, he's definitely got got minutes uh, in him for us he's definitely you could see the reason why him and Zinchenko were brought in by mm. Arteta. It was to instill that mentality of how to win uh, well, the Premier League and to win trophies on a repeatable basis, not just a one-off like we saw with the FA Cup. And I guess at the moment we are going through a relative dry patch um, in terms of winning trophies. But that's what we needed to do at the time. We needed to get out all of the uh, dead woods, all the people who were upsetting the balance of the team, and we needed Zinchenko and we needed Jesus to take the players we brought in that were relatively inexperienced of going to that next level and help guide the team to doing that. Because Arteta can't just do it on his own, despite you know, being in that city group for so long underneath under Pep Guardiola, still needed those kind of disciples who understood uh, the methods he was trying to bring in and bring everyone else on board and go, yeah, this is what we did at City. And clearly, City's track record is there for everybody to see with how prolific they are at winning. And maybe it will be sad to see some of them move on. Um, but definitely, we won't be, wouldn't have been in this position without those two coming in, not only for what they brought on the field, but off the field as well. Who would have thought six months ago would have had a run like this and saying, you know what, we can do without Jesus or Chinchenko. <laughs> You'd have put us all in, taken us somewhere in a truck, yeah. just to say <laughs> stuff like that. But um, listen, if, if Jesus isn't in the first 11 and he's sub, what a great plan B. We've actually got a plan mm. B now, gentlemen. We've not had that for ages. So it's, it's a great boon to have him. Absolutely. Yeah. In certain games, Chinchenko, when they don't play with a right winger, mm. We might have, there might be a you know he'd, he'd be a boom to us as well in certain games because he's his football he's got a great football brain it switches off when he gets to the touchline something happens to him but he has got a fantastic football brain mm-hmm. and he, he uh, I love watching him play most yeah certainly. absolutely he's infectious to watch isn't he yeah and yeah. I think that's it and that helps drive across the team as well that kind of infectious energy that's clearly we've got into that forward line now. Uh, but I think generally the big thing that it's brought us is while we may be talking about selling Jesus, well, if he wants to stay, 
great because with players underneath, strikers underneath, we've had to hold on to Eddie and Ketia, who, of the best will in the world, I know he scored a hat trick against Sheffield United uh, earlier in the season, but that's the kind of level where he'll be scoring goals consistently. And that's just raising up the quality of the squad, raising up the quality of our bench. As you say, Melvin, it's not only having that plan B, but it's a plan B we could rely on. And I think mm-hmm. that Enketi wasn't necessarily that at the moment. Yeah, what do we do about the um, the fact that Party made his long-awaited comeback and Zinchenko looks like he's going to be back soon and Tommy Asu is going to be back soon and uh, Jesus is going to be back soon? Is Arteta going to be able to say to this lot, you ain't getting in the first team. Look at this run of games we've been on. We, we Over the last seven games, I thought that point one eight um, at, uh, XG conceded was per game. It's not. It's over the space of seven games. So surely, um, don't call me Shirley, but surely Arteta is, isn't going to be just bringing in all these other players for the sake of it. You can't break up a winning team, can you? Whoever wants that. No, you can't break up uh, into. You need oh, to be consistent. I knew I should have asked one person. <laughs> go on, Mel. Go on, Melvin. Sorry. No, listen. Uh, consistency is the main thing, and if you know, with our defence, our defence uh, has played so well because they have played together now for so long. Bringing um, Kiro in and out the team, in and out the team, he wasn't doing it, was he? Now he's played a number of games there. You can see how he's learned. He's become part of our back four, and it's and it's good for the whole team that we played together. You know, the, the great teams don't normally make a lot of changes if they can help it. Even, you know, they're like Man City will make changes, but but only when they need to, not just for the sake of it, because someone's better behind them. If they're not doing it, they're not getting in the team. And that's what it should be. It puts pressure on the players in the team a little bit, and it puts more pressure on the ones that aren't in it to get in it. So it's all good news, all positive energy. So I'm very happy about that. Um, no, I think it's very, very good. Yeah, excellent. Rich? I was just going to say, uh, you know, based on that um, that dude from Finland who, who put in that stat on there and the fact that, you know, coming into March and April, we're gonna li- we are literally going to be playing, if we go further in the Champions League, a game every three days, I think it, you're going to have to see changes. So, the you, you know, we don't want to break up a winning team and stuff like that, but... You know, as long as you don't make wholesale changes like we used to do in the um, Europa League, you know, one for one or maybe one or maybe two at, at most and have it, you know, keeping people fresh and keeping people rotated and, and, and you know, in the in the vibe and in the form and stuff like that, I, I think it will be actually be necessary. You know, you, you, you look at, I think, like, you know, what's that stat with the um, the invincible side? You know, we could all sit here, all four of us, and we'll name that invincible side from every position and thing. I think that team played together, I think, five times that season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I I think you, you, you know, you're, you, yes, no, we don't want to break up the team and do, do Europa League style changes, but you know, bringing in a bringing in a party for a Jorginho maybe once, or you know, you give him give it. You know, there's something tactically that we need Ben White to sit deeper, and we want to we want to push on that left side so you can bring in Zinchenko. As long as you're not making massive massive changes, I think that that won't be too bad because we, let's say with a game every three a three game a, a game every three days now, that's going to be. That squad, that bigger squad, those Tommy Asus, those things, because they're going to be vitally important. And as Melvin said, what a replacement to come off the bench. You know, what you know, rather than bringing on and God love him, and my my Egyptian Pirlo bringing on El Nene <laughs> or bringing on Thomas Partey or bringing on Jorginho or something like that. That's that's what you know. That's the way we got to look at it, kind of thing. I think, and I think that's the way that um he uh, that Arteta will look at it. I, the other thing to bear in mind is the way we're blowing teams away at the moment is we're resting players. Yeah, after 60 minutes, you're seeing the heavy hitters coming off. And so I don't think this team is fatigued at the moment. And if we're continuing to do that, the only thing that helps us is rather than it being a case of it's four or five nil when we're playing stronger teams, where we're more likely not to be four or five nil up at the 60 minute mark, that we trust if we're two nil up that are taking Declan Rice off or taking Saka off 
we already know that the game is more or less won. It was, you know, perfect 1-0 to the Arsenal kind of stuff that we'd know we could just sit in and we're absolutely fine. Um, we could see a game out. And I think that's the great thing about this bench getting stronger and why the fixture list piling up for us doesn't worry me right now is because of that factor that if we maintain our level of form and we keep blowing teams away that maybe we'll just continue to see these things like thinking back to last season how many times was Saka taken off and rested didn't. when wasn't. he was crying out for it just wasn't and now no, we're wasn't. seeing that opportunity where he's just Arteta will actually go you know what I will rest you I will take Saka off because he trusts the options that we've got out there or that the game is won and it doesn't matter we'll Maybe we won't score another goal, but we've already got five. There's no way we're conceding six. That kind of uh, mentality. Yeah, oh, that's uh, that's a good point, and I agree with that a lot. Let's move on a little bit and talk about the Porto game. Um, a bit of a, a stunning result for them at the weekend. They had their best win of the season at home. They won five nil. I didn't check who they played. They smashed Benfica who were the best team in the league up until that point, who were nine points ahead of them in the top of the league, beat them 5-0. Benfica are on a run of 22 games undefeated, Richard. Last time Benfica conceded five in the league was another 5-0 loss at Porto 14 years ago. Are you concerned about Porto that we might not turn over that 1-0 lead? Loss? Um, no, not really. Um, we we played appallingly at that at the Porto game, and I I genuinely think that there was there was something wrong with the team that day. I mean, the amount of miscontrol passes, um, and I, like I said, I don't know if it was some they got their timings wrong with like jet lag and training and stuff like that, or they just they didn't handle the greasy pitch um, amid rumours of them overwatering it and stuff like that. The amount of miscontrol passes that we ne- and we but we still we still had like loads of possession and stuff like that and if we so I'm I'm not massively massively worried. Obviously, Arteta's knockout competition record isn't the best, and you know Porto are a good team. They've got really really good players and that. I just think with at home. We're not going to play as badly as we did away, and they they only just you know it was a wonder goal that that they 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 got so so you know I don't want to say famous last word and, and again come across as arrogant or, or thing like that because makes a game of football you can lose it so easily. But I I I'm not massively worried. I'm even that five news said that it's not really put the the fear of God up me. I think if if we get our our team right and we like I said we we play how we've been playing um especially at home I uh, say so, uh, and Porto's record in England is is supposedly awful as well um they don't travel well to to to, to England I th- I think we can turn them over and 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 go through I don't know about you guys I think I Benfica think... are currently losing to Rangers and that probably tells you about the quality of the opposition they played at the weekend um, oh yeah, they're yeah, losing two one. I think. But, sorry, Melvin. The, yeah, I think. I think the difference might be in this game. Obviously, we're at home, but hopefully, the ref will check for all the Porto players having their studs in their boots because I've done that yeah. <laughs> in the first leg. The way they kept slipping over. So hopefully, that'll change. Whether they look, they beat Benfica five nil, but I don't think they're coming to our ground to say, you know what, we can take Arsenal. They will have twelve men behind the ball. Don't, it'll be a frustrating night until we hopefully break them down. They're going to do all the tricks. And I only hope our, our, our um, set-piece coach has learned a lesson. You don't put all your players in the six-yard box because they will pull and punch you and everything. And there's too much going on for the ref to do anything. Spread ourselves about on the edge of the area as the corners take and leave one or two in there. And then it's isolated and it'd be easier for the referee, if he wants to see it, of course, to give something. It was very frustrating watching us. We did have a, a lot of possession, but I don't think we had a shot on goal, did we? If I'm correct? It was horrendous. So I think so. And yeah, no. I agree with you, Melvin, as well, that the um, it seemed like the set-piece coach didn't do his homework on their goalkeeper, that he liked to come and claim crosses because we yeah. kept putting yeah. it on top, basically on top of him. 
yeah. constantly. Just, oh, one one corner, just slightly out to the penalty spot, and the keeper wouldn't have got near it because we were blocking him off, but just playing the ball on top of him. So, yeah, it was frustrating as hell, and I think that's what it looked like. It was a bit of naivety, I think, that we just didn't adapt to what we saw. But I think an extra ninety minutes against the side and. Look, the road, is, the road that Man City took to the title or to the Champions League um, title was their away record was pretty poor. It was their home record that got them through those knockout ties. The Leipzig, where they won 7 0 at home, they drew 1 0 out there. They also drew the quarterfinals away leg and they drew the semi final away leg as well. It was when they brought them back to the Etihad that they really punched those teams that we know that they could. And I think, again, for us, we'll be comfortable. We won't have as many shenanigans because we'll set the pitch up as we want it. We know the Emirates will be comfortable there. And I feel like that's the main benefit we'll have. We'll be playing on the carpet. Oh, we'll have the fans I behind just, us. It'll be a glorious mm, European night, Richard. I just, I hope, as I said to Melvin's point, I hope the ref is stronger um, in this one. And because that was one of the most frustrating. I almost put my foot through my telly watching it. It was one of the most frustrating watches ever. Um, I just, I, I, I don't think, uh, I think of the eight corners or whatever we had, I think only two of them actually completed. Every single other one of them was, was ended up as a foul. It was just, it was an absolute disaster class of a performance. So hopefully, and you know, I, I don't want the fans to, you know, see the fans put pressure on, but hopefully like the, the, the Emirates crowd can, you know, kind of really highlight to the, um, you know, it's a great atmosphere. Hopefully it's a great atmosphere um, uh, uh, at the game. And, and they, they highlight that if they start trying this stuff, that we get on them straight from the off and, and you know, don't allow them to to, to, to play that shithousery card. Yeah, that would be the important thing. Plus, it all depends on the referee because the referee got completely in that early uh, hoodwinked in that game and it was an absolute disgrace. So, um Yeah. I'm not worried. Is anybody here worried? Anyone think we won't go through? That's the question. Just give me a yes or no. Um, Richard? We'll go through. Uh, Josh? We'll go through. I'm oh, sorry. I uh, that's not oh, any order. That's fine. I, I can throw my voice. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah I, th- I agree. I agree with uh, Melvin as well. We'll go through. <laughs> we'll go through. I'll do it while I'm drinking a glass of water. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Right, next thing I want to talk about is... Um, a little bit about who's going to come and go in the summer. We've seen that um, our, we've been screaming out for a striker. We now, Arteta's reinvented football. He's shown that we don't need a striker. We've got Kai Havertz, who will cover three positions at one time. We've got Erdegaard, who is now doing what he did last season. He's running into the box and making those runs and uh, scoring the goals, getting the assist. Saka this season has now played 36, 35 games, 16 goals, 15 assists, all competitions. Uh, Richard's shaking his head there for people at home and on the bus. Which do we need in the summer? Because at the moment, it doesn't look like we need much other than the players we've got to stay fit, does it? No, not really. Um, probably, I would I would say, depending on, on outings, I, I, uh, uh, departure, sorry, um, I think we're probably going to need a, a, a left-back. Um I would probably say again, depending on tomorrow, uh, another um, uh, central midfielder, um, and I and I think we need another. I don't think we well, not we don't need, but I I think with the players that we've we've got in the in the in the way that we're playing, I think it's less likely that we'll need a central striker, and more likely that we'll need, you know, uh, a wide forward. Um, just to you know, to supplement um, Martinelli and Saka, um, but it, again, it, it all depends on on departures, really. But I, I think the um, as much as everyone would all love a, a, a you know a, a new shiny centre forward and stuff like that, it's um, I think if if everybody hits their marks and everybody hits their um, uh, their their, their goals that they should and, and contributes as they should. I think it lessens that need for that central striker. I think let's say you, you're going to have, I don't want to get too much ahead of myself in this talk with the departure, but I think it really, really matters most on 
who is going. And I, I do think there's going to be a fair few, either, let's like, say, contracts just not being renewed or, or, or departures um, in, in, in the summer. Um, Josh, mm-hmm. Paul Nell, not Neil, has put in the chat, um, the ones going, ESR, Zinchenko, El Nenny. A moment for me and Richard there of our Egyptian bloodlines. Uh, Nelson, Nketiah, Ramsdale and Party. We know he's had enough of Nketiah because Nketiah isn't even getting a sub game where, uh, against Sheffield United. So uh, do you disagree with any of those ones that are going to leave there? Because that should bring in at least a hundred million, shouldn't it? Maybe more. Uh, I guess so. But what three of those players probably commanding transfer fees, maybe more. Um, I think some of those are probably leaving on freeze. I think there's certainly, without going into outgoings, I think in terms of ingoings is probably more of an idea of what we're looking at. Um, and I think it's going straight down the spine again, is the goalkeeper, centre-back, um, another probably central midfielder. It depends on Sambi. That's the question. And what he's doing at Luton at the moment, because he's putting in some impressive performances. It is. And that's a bit of a wonder for me on whether or not he does get reintegrated i know certainly he didn't um yeah during the arsenal oh, sorry the amazon documentary he certainly came over a bit um naive should we say that he wouldn't be straight on the first uh straight in the, um, on the team sheet when he came in from Anderlecht. it might have to work his way in but maybe that's something we have a look at um i'm also looking at yeah right back Probably because, well, Cedric's out, out, we know that. Um, but I wonder again, Ben White's played a lot of games and probably needs some cover in there. Um, and to go with Rich, I think we need a, another kind of wide forward number 10 kind of player. Um, Danny could probably work out which player I'd say I'd add to the list of the go. But the Belgian Arshavin, I think, is probably, he's done his well, short term right, stay yeah. here. And I'd move on. I'd move on Trossard. Um, I think it's mainly because his corners piss me off. Um, yeah, <laughs> they should do that. Okay. Along yeah. the bottom of the screen, we have a yeah. quote from Josh <laughs> Leonardo Trossard is just a Belgian Austrian. Josh, I January 2023. Yeah. Do you stick by that? I do stick by that. And it's one of those that in the warm up is just do one thing and it will tell you about Leandro Trossard. Just say, Leandro, put a corner in for me. If he completes it and beats the first man, fine, put him on the subs bench. If he can't, don't, because he will be shit for you. That is very simple. Trossard's a simple player. I've watched him for years and that is it. That, and if he gets kicked, he becomes better. There's the two Plus things. Some team is going to see the way he's played for us and go, oh, we'll have him. We'll make some money. Yeah. Um, we will end up fawning and going, oh, I wish that, that winger that's scoring 10 goals a season for Aston Villa would come and join us. I uh, wish we'd not got rid of him when we're having a particular dry spell in front of goal. But um, yeah, I think there's plenty of players in and around that we can look to to move on. Um, so I don't think it would be too big. I think obviously we've got, uh, what's the other word? Uh, yeah, our youth academy as well. Who's coming from there? I think Patino would be interesting to see what he can do in the summer. Um, he is having a very, what should I say, hot and cold loan spell at the moment. Um, he's either on the score sheet or he's doing nothing. It's, um, it's very interesting for what a holding midfielder can do. And obviously we've got some other boys out on loan as well. Um, I've mentioned Sambi. So yeah, um, I should probably give Melvin a chance to answer this. Otherwise I'll end up speaking till midnight. <laughs> No, I owe you about half an hour, Josh, get battening, don't I, really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's this is one of the seasons, and I always want to see new blood come in. It, 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 it freshens up the squad. However good you are, you should always look to freshen up the squad in the summer. But it wouldn't be a disaster. It wouldn't be great, but it wouldn't be a disaster if we don't actually buy anyone this summer. I'm sure we will, but going back last year and go back 20 years, if we didn't buy anyone, it's like, oh, my God. What we're going to do, we're going to have a crap season. Of course, we haven't bought anyone. It's not the case now. We've got so many positions that we, we can cover for. And talking about um, the right back position, we've missed, we haven't mentioned Timber. I really think we should, you know, you're saying that we haven't got any cover for right back, Ben White. We need a right back. Well, a new, it's like a new signing, Timber. <laughs> I mean, I know we've only seen about 38 seconds of him, 
he looked good that 38 seconds yeah. I must admit. well 37 of them anyway so no i i would definitely i'm i'm so excited to hopefully get him coming back at some stage yeah. i think that Partey, yep they're all the play players you've you met when that guy mentioned about six or seven players and you said we do over 100 i mean realistically now ramsdale you're talking about 50 realistically Let's not be silly. We're not going to get. We're not going to ask for thirty, are we? We're not. We haven't gone back to those days, have we? With thirty Hopefully million, not. no. And who else was on there? Chinchenko. What are you going to get for him? Thirty-five, forty. You're not going to ask for twenty, mm -hmm. are you? And you'll get it as well. You will get it if if he wants to go and we want to sell him. So that's a hundred. And you've got other players. Well, I'm talking about. I'm talking about a lot more than a hundred. And uh, they're Eddie. worth a lot more than a hundred. Yeah, they but are. Whether we, whether whether we are. get it or not. With our yeah, history of selling players for mm. I mean, the last player we got decent money for would have been Joe Willock to Newcastle. We we got a very good price for him there. But the rest of the players that have gone out, we got like a million for Big Bob Holding or something, wasn't it? And we got, yeah. I mean, it's like, mm. I think 370,000 we got from Monreal. I mean, why even bother getting any money? <laughs> 370 oh. grand. Look it up, people. It, it, it's a fact. It's ridiculous. I mean, put me in yeah. charge. I go, it, it, Ramsdale's England number one. He was Premier League goalkeeper of the season last season. He's only 25 years old. Starting yeah. bid, 70 million. Because they paid that you're... much for that, that dwarf in the Everton goal, wouldn't they? <laughs> I mean, I mean, 70. I, I, when I said 50, I was being conservative. Oh, yeah. I, I, no, I, think, I agree I think... with you. You'll get more than that, but I didn't want to be. Oh, yeah, we get 70, 80 million. We, I think no, no, it's realistic. It's, okay. it's realistic. Yeah, that's good. That's good. No, and who do we want? I think we do need another midfielder, cover for party because party are either be there and play three games for us next year or won't be there at all. So we need cover for party. I mean, I saw him play the other night. I know he hasn't played for ages, but how many cans of oil does he need to get match fit? Because he was very <laughs> rusty. Come on. Yeah. He was very. He gave the ball away, I think, four times in that very short period of time. And they that's the only four attacks they had, Sheffield. So he will get better, but will he be better by the end of the season? So, yeah, we need another midfielder. Uh, obviously, we need another goalkeeper. If it's a big word, we get rid of Ramsdale. So Ramsdale, we need another goalkeeper there. Another wide player. Perhaps we don't need another wide player if we get Jesus stays in the squad. Perhaps we don't. But, um, and... Uh, like La Conga, I don't know. I you know he's played well for uh, Luton. I've seen him, seen him a few games. He looks really good, but can he make the step up again? You know, it, it's an unknown, absolutely unknown. And Patino, I don't think he, I don't think uh, he's going to do it. I honestly don't. I'd love to see him do it, but I think that a couple of years ago, when he when he was really doing well in the reserves, we were we weren't that good midfield wise. Um, two or three years ago, we weren't that good. Now we've got a really good midfield. I don't think he can make that step up and come in seamlessly. I think those days are gone for him. But uh, he'll have a good. He'll have a good. Um, he'll be a good footballer somewhere else. He'll, he'll do very well. But I think we're looking at different levels now because we we are a different level team. We aren't the team that gets beat three goes three nil down at home to Man City in the first twenty minutes anymore. But that's 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 not happening. That's not happening. So. I, th I think that when we, the one we were talking about, and I've never seen him play, is a G in his name and a Z in his name plays oh, up front. You help me, Yokeres. Yokeres, yeah. and I can help what you that, with that. What that man? What that man said? I don't know how to yeah. pronounce it. What that man said? What's he like? Bless you. What's he like? Uh, loves to chase his first touch. We'll put it that way. And he's scoring in a league that isn't that high quality. Uh, Would enough. he make the step up from playing Championship football last season? I think was where I'd say was many people calling out, oh, that's the guy we should be buying. He's the starting striker for Coventry City. Um, again, I don't think we're at that level, especially for the money that uh, Sporting are asking for. Um, he's one that at the moment, I see a lot of him because he was on Brighton's books, inevitably. Um, Do you see the YouTube they shipped video him about off. him? Very yeah. interesting. I think they... Yeah. they Brighton had so many young players mm. that had come through that they bought. He did, and then a manager changeover. Mm. He just got loan after loan. Struck it lucky at Coventry. Yeah. They thought, yeah, well, they'll get rid of him. Mm. He's gonna. I think if he came to the Premier League, they're gonna want 60, 70, 80 million. And mm. if he came to the Premier League, he would. He, he'd get gold, but he, he wouldn't be brilliant. They're, 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 in the video, they were saying he's the new Zlatan because he plays for Sweden. Behave. Oh. He's uh yeah, he's a thirty million pound player, but 
you know what Portuguese sides are like when they try and move a player on. The player I'd look at that's similar but better, um, and Boy tendio has gone for it, is um, uh, Joshua Jerky, who's at um, Bologna. Uh, but is, uh, he's there from Bayern Munich. But Bayern Munich, obviously, they've helped us out, but they've got the um, yeah Arsenal fan himself up front. Uh, so there's no real starting position for him, but I think, yeah, Zerki's the one I'd have a look at. Um, and yeah, I think Stan the Man's gone in for Ollie Watkins as another potential option, but yeah, doesn't really sure fit. Doesn't exactly doesn't really fit the model we're going after. We're going after these younger players, right? We want. If you look at the players we're buying, uh, generally. They're young players with a lot of minutes in their legs, a lot of first team football. Ben White was a perfect example. He'd had five loans until he joined us, and he was, what, 23 by the time he came in? But clearly, a hell of a lot of experience, a hell of a lot of appearances under his name. Declan Rice, again, very young when he made his debut and played it at a high level. So that's where I think you're looking at the players we'd be going after is just check how early they started playing first team football number of minutes and career appearances they've got it's probably going to be in triple figures but being particularly young we that's where i thought mudrich really confused me why we were interested in him because that seemed really off from what we've normally done we don't really look at those raw players anymore we've not we got burnt by pepe i can't see us being uh burnt again by a similar player Yes, uh, Stan in the chat, our very own Stan, is talking about tea bags. So we have the obligatory tea bag in the top right hand corner. Um, let's have something a little bit nice. Let's have a, a picture of, um, of Ellis. We love Ellis. Bless him. It'd be lovely if he could do a show. Um, never know, might, might, have, might kidnap him. He's not too far from me. I could kidnap him and bring him in. Ah, that's a plan. Um, right, the next thing I want to talk about is the international break. Um, people, we're, have you got some questions? We've got four questions at the moment. If you can put them in the chat, start it with the letter Q. makes my life a lot easier. So um, international break, Richard, um, like we were saying before the show started, just in time for Tommy Ashew to come back. He got injured at the, the, the African Cup of Nations. He got injured at the Asia Cup, and he's just going to be fit. And then it's international duty again. He's one of their best players um, he's an absolute monster. Is it? Will we have that? Will we do what Wenger used to do, or what Alex Ferguson do? Oh no, he's, he's got his legs to come off. He can't play. Has he got the the bottle to do that? Because they can't keep taking our players, injuring them, and then giving them back with uh, with no receipt or anything like that, or, or no compensation. Because uh, they didn't lend us another Japanese player. So no, you can't. You broke the last one. You ain't having any more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I do sometimes wish we we, we employed a, a little bit of the, the, the Ferguson uh, tactics. I think um, Ryan Giggs played for like 23 years and only got like 60 caps or something ridiculous. Yeah. True. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, the only, the only, I, the only good thing about, because again, it's just, it, it's going to come at such a crappy time for us. The only good thing about that I can think of it is, is Ghana, I don't think are playing. So Thomas Party is not going to go away. So he'll he'll be with us the entire time. And I think um, as far as where I think Brazil are playing in Europe. So I think they're playing England and is it Spain? I want to say. I think it's France, but yeah, it, they're basically in okay, yeah. Europe, aren't they? Yeah. So it, no. So Gabby and Gabby are not going to. Uh, is Gabby Jesus? I don't think he's been called up. Is he? I don't think many of them sure have had a horrendous run. I think they've got rid of a couple of managers. They've got another caretaker manager who's also managing uh, a Serie A Brazilian side. And uh, they, they kind of went with Martinelli and Jesus up front and they were terrible. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think the future is yellow and blue for our, our Jesus. Mm. So, yeah, so ho hopefully, like I said, we, they, they say we can wrap them all in, in cotton wool, those who are going away. And, um, you know, the rest of them can go to Dubai again and, and have a, get some more vitamin D into, uh, into Ben White. And um, we can continue playing um, how, how we're playing. Because, as I say, it's, 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 it's crap 
thing. I mean, I, I, I'm not like I know it's it's quite you know the cool thing to hate international football, and I've always I've always liked international football. It's how one of the first things I I remember uh, from a kid was you know. Uh, growing up watching tournaments and stuff like that i've always been a sucker for it i've always liked it so i i, I normally when it's an international break i'm not like most people where it's all they're dour and down about it kind of thing but this one it's just it just it almost feels like it's come at the wrong time for us um just because of of, of how well we we've been playing but yeah hopefully hopefully the ones that are going away like i said they're not having to travel very very far um, and we can manage their minutes because so what what international break is it is it qualifiers for something or is it literally just friendlies it's a bit of both okay, yeah. it's the playoffs for the euros because there's the eurovision what, yeah because there's still what six teams that aren't decided yet that are playing in that or four anyway some of the group stage isn't complete yet uh then it's the yeah combination of the rest of the european uh teams are playing uh friendlies it's the last group of friendlies before the Euros. So, uh, yeah, so hopefully... America are doing. You see, we yeah, don't yeah, even know so about the... it, do we? Going back years, <laughs> we would know when England are playing, who other teams are playing. We were into it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We don't even know what the tournaments are now. I mean, <laughs> I don't like England playing because I lose my money every game. I have a bet <laughs> every game if Southgate is going to smile. And I'll say, he's got to smile the next game. I always <laughs> do my money. So that's why I can't stand it anymore. Uh, in, in other news, uh, on my eBay, I've just sold a Pokemon card for £20. I've just sold Joel Eaton, Joel Eaton, a shiny one. You can't tell from that. It's my phone. £20. Thank you very much. That's, that's what that little, that little noise was. I'm on a winner. I'm going to go and put the whole lot on Gareth Southgate to cry. <laughs> I'm going to counteract your smile, Melvin, with a <clears throat> with him actually having a, having a bit of a breakdown. Yeah, there's links of him going to Man United. Is there a more glorious oh, no. transfer than that? No. Oh, that is my that'd be Christmas all over again, wouldn't it? Oh, that would my be God, an absolute amazing. dream. There is oh, actually. Um, I don't know what's happened on oh, Twitter. Usually, no. we have about fifty or sixty watching on Twitter at the start. We have got 413 people watching at the moment and 390 of watching on Twitter. And they have been for the whole hour and a bit we've been watching. So I don't know if someone's paid them to watch, but hello, everybody on Twitter. If we're not following you on Twitter, just tweet us and go, hey, you, follow us. And then I will make sure that we, uh, that we follow you because uh, that's the kind of guy that I am. Um, right. So uh, should we have a little talk about kits? Have we finished talking about international football? Because yeah. I hate it. And I don't yeah. do it because it's trendy. <laughs> yeah. I, I just can't stand it. Um, yeah. Looking down at, uh, yet again, last week I showed some kits. This These kits seem to be a little bit more professional. Um, there's the home kit. It's, uh, uh, yeah, that's quite nice. I like that. Mm. I, I reckon somebody could have made these. God knows. That's the away kit. Oh I no, I don't like that. Banana in that. Too much no, blue. No, 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 no. It looks and like this that. is the third kit. That is that that's wrong. There's no it's need awesome. for that. I don't want any no. of that. Anybody no. interested in any of those kits? Because I won't. The home show looked nice. Like, like, I was I interested. Didn't in the yeah, I didn't realise that Adidas was still doing Climacool. I think they stopped that about ten years ago. But yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's the only thing oh. I noticed on that kit. <laughs> But it is silly season for kits. Everyone's mm -hmm. doing their their other the, the ones. Um, a little thing here. I saw this and stole it off of Twitter. It's how much shirt sponsorship and stuff because people are moaning about how much money Man City get um, compared to Newcastle, the richest team that's ever in, been invented. Uh, just looking at fifty million compared to twenty five for the shirt sponsor. Man City get fifty five million from Puma as a kit supplier. Dear idea. Sleeve sponsor, they get 20 million. Training kit, they get 20 million. Stadium naming rights, 15. And campus naming rights, 15. Uh, Josh, are Man City ever going to get caught up on that? Because Everton got docked uh, 10 points. It was um, 10 and it was only on one charge. So does this mean... Two charges. That... Oh, five points each. So yeah. does this mean... What's... what's um? 400 112 times uh, five that's gonna be five so five fifth so we got two thousand points yeah so yeah. Do, does that mean that 
Man City for the next hundred years are not going to have any points. They're just going to get relegated for the next hundred seasons because they're never going to do that, are they? They're going to chicken out and get away with it. We don't won't talk about this for too long. I'm just interested in um, um, how the re- charges relate to other clubs that aren't uh, giving brown envelopes to everybody. Well, I would say it's a lot harder to call somebody up on 115 things and build a case for 115 individual cases than it is to build two a case around two. I would say this is very similar. Um, and Danny, you're a fan of this sport, so you'll get the analogy. Oh. Um, Lance Armstrong and what oh, he hello. did in the Tour de France and the US postal team and how long that took. Everybody knew they were up to it, but they just couldn't pin them on it properly because there was so much evidence that was required. And what, that took 10 years? And that only came through because... Lance Armstrong gave up basically, went on Oprah and said, <laughs> Oh, fuck it. All right, then. I've stopped living that lie. And I, yeah. I and the big, sorry to, sorry to just interject, uh, uh, just, but Everton complied uh, with the investigation, whereas Man City are fighting it tooth and nail exactly. and tying it up in red tape every, every step. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Josh. No, I completely agree with you. They're making it more difficult. And. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if in five years' time it's only just going into court. (laughs) Because looking at other cases of systemic cheating within sport, it takes this kind of length of time to get stuff together. And that's where I allude to cycling, because that was a whole doping of an entire era. It wasn't just one particular race season that US Postal were uh, doping up to basically their entire team. That was, well, seven, eight seasons that they were doing it. And that took a significant amount of time. And I expect exactly the same for Man City. Uh, it will definitely get boring. We'll definitely get annoyed that we have to keep mentioning it. But Pep, Haaland, De Bruyne, all of their star players that we know now will have long left through getting you know, naturally rather than them leaving due to a Calciopoli-style relegation. I can't see it happening in um, yeah, in the immediate future. But I do like how the Premier League are now pulling their finger out and actually starting to look at this properly. Because you can see the fear. You saw the January window for Premier League clubs, how everybody wasn't um, yeah. wasn't spending at the same kind of level. And I get how some fans can be annoyed. I reckon if it was one of my teams that got um, docked points, I'd be livid. You know, the Brennan Johnson at Knott's Forest uh, situation that they waited five days after the deadline to sell him because they knew they'd get an extra 10 million that would help them out. But that's the reason why, because they didn't sell him in time. But we're talking about, you know, this isn't a Sunday league team. This is a team with lawyers, bankers, huge financial teams they know what the rules are i just don't understand why people are getting hung up on it by it being unfair this isn't as you say this isn't a small community club anymore it's a lot bigger than that the thing that annoys me about man city sponsorship deals and things like that is they did that before there was even a proper ffp in place where they said about fair market value so they managed to do that quick acceleration and inflate things and then go, oh, well, market rate is now 50 million because we defined that two seasons ago and everything's moved up and up and up. And the next one to probably break the ceiling would be Barcelona. Because yeah. that, yeah. Sorry, I'll go for it. I, I think that it's not unfair, it's wrong. There's a difference between something being unfair and something being wrong. Man City are wrong. And you're right, they've got so many great, I mean, they can spend all the money, they can actually hire all the lawyers every lawyer in the land to stop the other side getting any lawyers at all. That's what they could do. And I think that what will probably happen, they will be found guilty, saying 30 charges, 100% guilty. And what it will do, they will actually stop Man City ever, ever winning the English Cricket Championship. That's what they they get done for. (laughs) Because they're not going to take their titles away. They're not going to give Dockham 3,049 points. None of that, and it's no point actually fining them, because unless they fine them billions, and that's not going to happen. So it's irrelevant. I don't think anything will happen. It's sad. 
it's when football uh, lost its has lost its soul, and we just got to get on with it. I think. Mm. Um, I think that if they, they if they did take the titles off them, they'd do what they did in Italy and those seasons would be no champion for the Calciopoli seasons. They're not going to... Yeah. There's all that talk, Richard, where yeah. they said, uh, well, Arsenal will get two, Man United will get five, Liverpool will get three. That's never happening, yeah. is it? You, no. you can't do that because uh, ultimately because it will affect the relegation thing. So it's like, well, if you're giving them a championship and stuff like that, well, we shouldn't have been relegated because we got a draw at City yeah, and we yeah. could... Have, you you can't mess about with stuff like that. So as much as I would love to have had a, had our hands on the title last season, you can't... You, you, you'd you have to, like you said, Danny, you'd have to make it null and void and, and no winners that year. Don't you think, Richard, if we would have won it last year on the basis of them having say, five or ten points taken away from, would have diluted our victory. Look, it nice, looked nice on the old uh, wall, but it would be a diluted championship, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be the same as winning it, really winning it. No, yeah, you, you'd always have that, that kind of little black mark and X. And well, I wouldn't look at it that way, personally, because it's like they've, it, they've cheated. That's not Arsenal's fault that these guys have been absolutely morally corrupt and circumvented uh, uh, you know the, the rules and and cheated there's not like like you said it's not unfair it's wrong it's cheating you know but there it was a bit like you know that that asterisk that that always that, that some fans will always hold against Liverpool for their title win because it happened during the covid um nonsense and things like that but um i i, I would still rather have us won the league <laughs> last season even if they did get Docked points for cheating, but I know what you mean. Like I said, you you you'd always have that little asterisk next to it, and you know that little check mark that that, that people would be able to hold over us. You know, the team that would celebrate it though is if it would be Tottenham, because yeah. I think they come out of that if it does get reassigned to the team that came second, they come out with a trophy from it. But and wouldn't it be yeah. just their luck? The the only trophy they do, yeah. they can't celebrate <laughs> it for five or six years. Oh, that'd be so Spursy. <laughs> That, uh, that's almost as good as Harry Kane winning the Bundesliga top goal scorer and being presented with a cannon as the uh, uh, as his prize. That we'll go with the the room. Room. Yeah, room, exactly, exactly. It is. It's beautiful. Um, let's go. And we've only got five questions, people. We're only going to go for. Was there another sneaky question at the bottom there? No, there wasn't. Right. Start off with you, Melvin um, from Phil. Hopefully, this is a good one. Does anyone fear the Arteta Barcelona talk is true? Well, I don't. I mean, Barteta, I do believe they want him, probably. They probably do, but he's but going exactly nowhere. Well, they can't have him. Yeah, he's going nowhere. Absolutely no, nowhere. I think it's more than... For, for. Let's put it this way. For Arteta to come to the Arsenal, there must be something in it because he must have watched us and seen what squad we had and how poor we were and thought, why would I want to go to this club? So there's something more than just the money he's getting or becoming a manager for the first time. There's something more intringent than that. And I think that you can see it in the way the team, uh, what he, how he's, he has got love for the club. He's part of our club. I'm not saying we have to have a manager to play for us, but he gets us. He gets the club. And that's a that's a positive advantage. He's, when he, well, why should he want to go? To, I know they're a bigger club than us in Europe, most certainly. They used to be. Most certainly. But why would he want to do that? He's actually, he's got his DNA all over this club. I know he used to play for Barcelona Mucking when he was up. a youth team player, didn't he? But why would he want to sacrifice what he's built here? He's actually built something. No, I'm not worried about that at yeah. all. No. Okay, one for you, Richard, from uh, Jimmy H. He says this for me, but I'll let you have it. I don't answer questions. Not about my brief. <laughs> uh, 11 games to go. What comes first? Eddie scoring a goal or Arsenal or Sheffield for Arsenal or Sheffield United getting a win again this season? Now that is a tricky one. Um, you'd probably put, put more more like on Eddie coming on and, and maybe one going off off his ass if you, if they uh, if Sheffield United play like they did against us for the rest of the season. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to plump for Eddie because I want Eddie to score. Why not? I'd rather yeah. I'd rather Eddie score a goal than Sheffield United get a win. I don't. No offense, Sheffield United Blades fans. I don't really have anything. Uh, like so about if, if, if Chad is watching, who was, who was a Sheffield United fan, who was kind enough to come and join us in the last post game, uh, I don't agree with Richard at all. That's I think that's quite mean. Uh, question for Josh from Jimmy H again. Right in the summer, we did 
did we underestimate what really Kai, Rice and Raya actually brought to the team? Raya was stupid, was a stupid buy, but has been proven wrong over, over overall. Should fans just shut up now on transfers? Thank you very much for that, Jimmy. You've made me look like I can't, I can't read. So, make, make a, Jimmy, I will sell, I will sell you a comma for twenty five pounds. I'll put it on eBay. Josh, save me. Oh yeah, um, if you can put it back up, because I couldn't remember it. I was just. Uh... <laughs> Laugh about what's going on. I couldn't read it. There you go. Well, I know. Rearrange this right. sentence right. in a well known I, I think he just, I think he just <laughs> missed out a word because he said, what he's put is, yeah. right, actually brought to the team. Then there's a comma, and then I, and I think he thought Raya was a stupid buy, but have been proven wrong. Over, and then he said, overall, should fans just shut up now on transfers? It's all the right he's words. Obviously, on his phone. Right order. That's it. <laughs> he's um, on his phone, and these things yeah. happen. Sorry, Jimmy. Jimmy, um, I think we certainly underestimated at least two out of three of those. I think every fan, every fan at least had one that we were like, yeah, that's a great purchase. Or I think we overpaid um, across them. I was certainly all in the Kai in boat. I had my question marks over Rice and I had a huge question mark over uh, David Raya. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, we, I think they're there to prove us wrong, for sure. Um, I would also like to be smug on the, the transfers I thought that worked out um, or didn't work out as well when you say I told you so. But should we shut up on transfers? I mean, there's a lot of good podcasts that would go if we didn't talk about transfers and there are probably a lot of bad ones as well. Um, so maybe it's not all bad if we, did not, if we didn't speak about transfers. But yeah, Danny, I think we would did look a little bit stupid. Egg on our face. Other breaking news. Some I've got a Pokemon folder still in its packet for sale on eBay. £20. Someone's offered me 10 No bueno. <laughs> right. Next one is for Richard. It's from Avon. Right. Uh, does Fabio Vieira fit in the interior of our midfield now? Comma. And if he doesn't, are cameos in wide positions enough minutes to keep him at Arsenal? Question mark. Perfectly done. Thank you very much, Avon. You've made my day. <laughs> Sorry, Jimmy. Yeah. yeah, poor Jimmy. Um that's such a hard one because I'm I'm probably I'm probably the wrong person to talk about Fabio Vera because he was one that I've I've never been massively sold on him. You see enough green shoots and little things that he does and you know little you know little tidy things that he does, but it always seems to he can never kind of get a run of games together to kind of make any f form fit kind of thing you know um it's it's so hard to be successful when you are only a bit part player and then you know like i said he, he's I, I feel sorry for him you know like when when he turned up at the club he was injured you know, he, he seems like he's just starting to get things, and he gets injured again. Not, not that he's had like a massive load of uh, of injuries. Um, I'm not sure he has the the pace and directness out wide. I don't think. Um, so, I, you know, you'd think that the interior would be a little bit of a, a better fit for him. I actually, you know, I, I think in that Erdegaard role. But he's probably the, the closest thing to his SP. But I mean, like, you know, it's he's going to, when is he going to get that chance to, to, to oust Odegaard? Because o Odegaard is just absolutely phenomenal, like, it, it, but both in and out of possession. Um, and I, I think that the, the left eight position of how we play it on and have been playing it um, is a little bit, to two way for him, if that makes any sense, as in like you know getting getting up and down and having that defensive solidity and physicality and stuff like that. I I, I would I would say that Erdogan position is his best fit for and for his qualities and and style. I mean, you know, guys, jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I just I struggle to see him you know touch wood unless something catastrophic happens to. To, to Erdegaard, I say I can't see him getting minutes in in that thing, and I just I think out wide, I just I don't think he has that directness 
mm. and that pace to beat players and be because one of the things so I'm going to uh, 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 rabble on with it. in that wide in those wide areas especially like Saka and and um, Martinelli less so but like Saka one of the things that makes him so deadly and such a force is he can go both ways he can step into that interior onto his left foot and you know have a shot play a pass I think or he's got the pace and directness to to go in behind and he's got the 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 bravery and confidence on his right foot that he can he trusts himself on that right foot so i, I think you know and that, obviously then that left back or right back um sorry left back it will will he's, he's fearful he doesn't know which way he's got to go and i don't, i don't think from what i've seen i may be proved wrong but i don't think fabio vieira has that in his locker just yet that like I said that directness and I think like I said I think the interior might be a little bit better for him. I don't know about if you guys want to jump in on that I, question if you have other thoughts to me. I'd say there's one player that or so one person that at the club that absolutely loves Fabio Vieira and that's the make or break of him and that's Mikel Arteta. He absolutely say Fabio Vieira. No Fabio Vieira well other than Martinelli as well as their besties but oh. um well, you see everything. They're always together. Um, mm. But we do know from an uh, old friend of the pod, uh, Simon Collings, that one of his favourite players uh, of Mikel Arteta's is Fabio Vieira. Absolutely loves him. And so I think he'll always find a position for Vieira. I think, personally, Rich, the way I'd see his role is if we go for purposely unbalancing our team and making it top-heavy. So those situations, you know, we see Liverpool, if anyone saw Liverpool's lineup today, you know, when they weirdly play Gakpo in midfield, for some reason, you're like, he's a winger or a striker. I think if they're looking, to, if we're looking to overload a team full of attacking creativity, I think that's where we see Vieira, when we kind of trust the defensive unit we've got in place and we can go, we could take one player out of that for this game and we could just put another attacker in place. That's where I kind of see Vieira's role at the moment. Um and I would be very surprised if we moved him on because I think the way that Arteta feels about him is like he's one of his sons, loves him, loves us a bit. But if I do know anything, our director of football knows how to sell his son. Um, if anyone remembers. Yeah, to Watford. Exactly. Uh, mm. so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a NFFP that thing that needs to be looked at. You know, brought his son into our academy and then shifted him off to Watford a year later for a couple of million. But anyway. Um, yeah, before I ramble on about it, that's that's my thoughts on Vieira. For me, Vieira has got so much skill, but he is one of those players that I mentioned before that we didn't have in, in the first 11 that can be bullied. And I think you can bully him out of a game. I really do. He's just not physically right at the moment. And I don't mean about getting injured. I mean, he's a very slim, small, diminutive player. And to be that, you've got to be something special like Silver of Man City. He can get away with it. And, and, and uh, Vieira, at this moment in time, isn't at that level. He might be, but for the moment, not for me. Right. Um, where were we up to? Uh, three more questions. Should get this done. Just over an hour and a half from Demsek. Hello, Demsek. I hope you're OK. Uh, to Josh, why not move Havertz to be the striker and bring in another box-to-box -box player? Hey, Demsek. Uh, I agree. It, uh, I think if you missed the bit where we were speaking about Havertz, I think that's probably the move we end up going for rather than buying that marquee striker. So like an Osserman or someone of that ilk, we look at a level below. Um, maybe a Jao Pedro, as I say, Zerki, someone who's going to cost us maybe less than, less than 50 million, I would say. We'd look at that kind of striker and then look at another big box-to-box -box player who would come in and allow us to link up that box because... The way the style we're playing this year, I don't think we play exactly the same next season. It's a bit like you see the evolution of Man City. They're never quite the same team year on year. So there will always be something that will will tweak or change. And I guess if we're looking at someone like Thomas Partey moving out, that's an opportunity to bring in a player like that who can play between the two boxes as well as cover and be that kind of Rice uh, player if he's unavailable. That makes a lot of sense. So um, next one is going to be um, for you, Melvin. I'll leave the last one to be for Richard. From formerly knows of Melvin, will there be an Anfield-sized sinkhole on Sunday? That will be 3.45pm uh, in the UK. 
Uh, Liverpool v Man, uh, v Man City. And he said United then. No. What do you think? I know what a sinkhole is. What do, what do we mean by that? I don't quite They're all understand. going to fall in it and we're never going to... Or, either Man City are going to disappear into the sinkhole or both sides are going to disappear into the sinkhole. I don't know. I think it's... Listen, it's one of those games you look forward to as a neutral. Two top teams playing each other at the moment. I mean, it's... Uh, and we're part... I know we're not part of it this, this weekend, but we're part of it in a couple of weeks, aren't we? And it's... We haven't been there for years, so I'm looking forward to the game. Uh, you know, in our heads, we obviously want either City to win or a draw is the best result for us. But uh, no, I look forward to this game. It's great. It just it shows you where we've where we've come to, where we are now, to where we were a couple of years ago. No, we're going to have we've had games like this at Anfield this year, very big game, and away at City this year. That's also going to be a very big game. We're part of this, and I'm looking forward to Sunday's game as well. Would would you guys t would you guys take uh, a la 1990 a uh, 22 man brawl and a points deduction for both teams? <laughs> well, let me think about that. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, WrestleMania is coming up, and it's up to them if they want to do that. Uh, final question from Seb, who you can often find doing stuff uh, as a guest on the Hybrid Squad and post game shows with uh, with Sophie. He's a very good talker. He says, Richard, what are your thoughts on Spurs being able to do well in FFP? Do we need to upgrade? Do we need upgrades in facilities? And also, I heard today on the uh, the AC Jimbo pod, Spurs make more money per home game than any other team in, on the planet. So yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's depressing. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It's uh, say so, We were such a guinea pigs when we, when we built the Emirates kind of thing. You, you almost kind of, we, we waited a, a couple of years for that. TV money to really, really break the deal. You know, everybody like, like say Spurs and, and other clubs and that they kind of looked at what we did or any mistakes that we made with the Emirates. You know, like the the, the not being able to, to increase the capacity and get in sponsorship things and sorting out things. Like, you know, it, it pains me to say it, but they've been in, Spurs have been incredibly clever with how they've marketed and sort out opportunities with the NFL, with, you know, concerts and rugby and boxing and stuff like that. They've been very, very clever, you know, um, sorting out the, the the train station near them as well. I think they they got the, you know, the, you got the council to do that with them as well, I think, they, they, to, to save some money. But unfortunately, they've been very, very smart. I, I, they say we... we I, I, uh, Melvin, correct me if I'm wrong, you go to um, home games... Um, yeah. You, you, yeah. Yeah, you'd, you'd probably be more, more. I mean, I, you know, I used, I used to work for the club when the stadium was built, um, up until um, 2012. Um, so I, I remember all the struggles we had when we, when it was getting made, and you know, it seemed to be, let's like, say, this big rush job. And they, they are, they, they have built up things, you know, uh, with like the, 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 the hub next to the stadium and stuff like that. But I think you'd be probably more more pressed to talk about what, what upgrades we need at the um, at the stadium and stuff like that. Well, when things are going well like now, you can't think of upgrades. I don't think it'd be so perfect. But I think that with the, not the stadium, the club needs an upgrade on their website. I think it's the worst website this side of the Mississippi. I'm, I'm going to university next year to find out how to actually get through it and see how you can uh, do things on it. Because it's really, really difficult. Seriously, it's not consumer friendly. The ground itself, it's very good. Getting in is quite easy. Apart from that Forest game, first game of the season, when it went a bit pear-shaped. Getting in is quite good. I, th I think it's a little bit OTT at half time when you have an Americanization of, of the ground. I don't like that. The entertainment half times before. I think what they've have how they've managed to do it. They've managed to um, like half time to get a drink. I'm not a drinker, but I do like some. I would get even a cup of tea or something. I love that. But it's not worth it. You don't want to miss the second half. Anything of the second half to just try buy a cup of tea. It's so well badly organised the way they that they've uh, planned it. And, and then they sell stuff at half time. They could sell a lot more if they if they actually thought about it and, and, and did it better. Um, other than that, no, I think it, it's fine. It's fine. I, I don't think, go on. 
can I jump in on one of those? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and Danny, if I think if you put the question back up a second, I think the difference, and this isn't a go at Seb, but you can tell the difference between a match going fan and one that isn't that non match going fans are striving for us to be at the top of the most match day revenue. I want us to be near the bottom. I want Arsenal to be affordable. I want us to make no money from ticket sales mm. almost because it's getting, it's pricing us out of the game that, yeah, fine. The box area, make that extortionate because those are the people with the money. But to get in to the lower bowl, 20 quid. To the upper bowls, 15. Make it affordable. Fill it up. Pack it out. And that's where we then need the upgrades and facilities or get the sponsorship. The stadium's still going to be as valuable as it always is, right? It doesn't matter if you're charging £100 on the door or 50 quid on the door. People will still want to sponsor it. Emirates is still worth that same amount. But I think making ticket prices more affordable, I don't want to say that we've got a big top at the table for most match day revenue for the number of tickets or the price of tickets. You know, Spurs have got the most expensive season ticket in the Premier League. And that doesn't include cup credits, whereas ours does. I know that hasn't been mentioned for years. That the uh, it doesn't it doesn't include it doesn't cup anymore. Credits. It's now taken out, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah, Does because I think the, I think the League Cup yeah. I didn't have to pay for. No, but the European game I had all the European games I switched paid for, and I think it really whacks up the amount of money I spent. I thought when I got my renewal, I thought that's not too bad. I think it's probably about yeah. the same price. Well, that's good. Mm. Then I realised you got to pay for the cup ties, the European. And they're ones. fifty quid, aren't they? A go. Well, my least. one is a yeah. A bit more than that. It's a joke. And yeah. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw the price. And it wasn't, as I yeah. say, it wasn't easy to find on the website to confirm what the price was. I suddenly had something mm. taken out my bank account because they do it automatically if you want. I thought, what's all that about? And I couldn't yeah. find it on the website. But I'm sure they took the right money out for me. <laughs> um, but uh, but what, I, we could have a whole program and it talking mm. about lowering prices. And then you've got the problem. You'll have... Eight times the people want to get in there that get there at the moment, and yeah. people can't even go to home games, Josh. So how mm. do you how do you square that circle? Yeah, that's the other thing. Is it's going? Do we now look for another stadium that can take a hundred thousand people? Is that it? Because we know we'd sell it out. We know how big the season ticket um, yeah, waiting it's, list it's, is. Waiting list is it's huge. So we definitely, in theory, fill it out. But we know the reason why people want tickets at the moment. It's because we're doing well. All the people that. Well, I wouldn't say all of them, but a lot of people who are moaning weren't seen dead at the Emirates during the Emory era or no, during the end of the Wenger era. But there are a substantial amount of people who are now, due to changes the club have made, it's a lot more difficult. It's technically mm. more fair, but it's not in the other way, is it? No, it's, uh, and it's, it's, there yeah. are people, though, Josh, that I know, like for this week, someone who is a top, top Arsenal fan mm. who just can't get a ticket. And he's yeah. asked me, I said, I'm sorry, I don't know of any. But, and he's a top, top, and there's a lot of people that I know who just cannot get tickets, and they're true Arsenal fans. And for yeah. whatever reason, they haven't got a season ticket. Right? They yeah. got the, I, what it used to be like, you're saying, were we doing well? We used to have a lot of people coming to Arsenal, sitting in front of me where I sat, and they knew nothing about football. They were basically coming, instead of going to the theatre and saying mm. to their pals, I went to London, I went to the theatre, no, I went to London and watched the Arsenal play. Did you really? Oh, that's good. They weren't even watching the game. They turned no. up late. They went half time before half time come. They're going outside. Mm. Turned up late in the second half. And they're on their phones. Though we used to get a load of those people. I'm sure there still are, mm. but hopefully we can change that. You know, yeah. I don't know how these people get these tickets from abroad. And anyone from abroad can come, but be a football fan, mm. please. Don't do yeah. it like you're going to the theatre. Yeah, there's a lot that's um, obviously the fan groups get. A section of tickets and i think that's how it should always be you know you have a pool for those uh fans i know um there's a group up in lancashire that have a pool of i think they've got four season tickets between 10 15 of them and that's that's the kind of thing that you want to see you know, help bring the arsenal in that's yeah good. that's the kind of thing good. i think it's trying to work out how we define loyalty without accidentally excluding people who are loyal um, because you could say, oh, if someone's been a member for 50 years, well, unfortunately, I'm only 32. Does that mean I can't get a ticket? Because you'll then suddenly end up with a age demographic at the uh, Emirates where everybody's about to pop off. We'll have to have more St. John's Ambulance people and uh, 
in the stadium. But I think that's the, it's a difficult thing. I can certainly see that there's frustrations everywhere. I don't think we'll ever find a perfect way of doing it. But for me, the easy win is just dropping ticket prices because we, Edu could negotiate slightly, a slightly better deal somewhere and we'd make back a match day revenue difference by just dropping, halving the ticket prices. Well, you're right. I, you I was, I was saying... It's not the ticket it's prices on. anymore, is it? Mm. it? It's all sponsorship. Years ago, if you had a low attendance, you could be out of business. It doesn't really matter now, does it? Then our percentage of what we take through the gate or through season tickets, add that up. It used to be 90%, 95% of our revenue. I don't know what it is. Perhaps you could tell us, Danny. Do you know what it is now? No, no I'm no good with numbers. It's not 95, though, is it? It's, I bet it's, it, I'd be surprised if it's one. Really? Really? Like, it's really? One percent. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, but, hearing... I think where Spurs have kind of stolen a march kind of thing is is they've got those those links and they're renting out that stadium, mm. you know, to Matchroom for for the the you know Anthony Joshua fights, mm. um, to the the Gallagher Premiership for Saracen games and things like that, you know, for the NFL and things like that. For that's where I think, and I think that's what Seb, was it Seb the guy who asked mm. the question? Yeah. I I think that's maybe the angle he was more driving towards and stuff like that is you know is finding other revenues and other ways to maximize uh, and and get in because i think that's that's you know that's one thing where i think we we've lacked um a, a little bit is is getting those strategies and those sponsorships and those deals and those partnerships in place you know i, I think we I think we we did we, we were so unlucky we we did have one where, where the uh, the rugby league world cup was was mm. due to be played at the Emirates and then like again it, covid hit and it all it all scarpered it kind of thing um but yeah that says more of those I think we definitely need to do more on that side of the of the club of of, of getting those those sponsorship deals in 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 place there's a there's a club that we all loathe that I will mention is currently building a stadium uh, yeah, a stadium in their complex for hosting concerts and things like that. Um, that were gifted their ground after the Commonwealth Games um, and now use it to uh, pump oil money into the country. Um, hmm. I won't mention who exactly is doing that, but yeah, um, in that area, they're being a rival to the MEN arena. So, oh dear. Yeah. Sad times. Right. Hey. We've got 610 people watching. Hello, everybody. Uh, come back next oh, week no. yeah it's, it'll be never, good 612 never, now never put my makeup on oh, oh no I ain't, i'm not wearing trousers i think you're having oh, troubles <laughs> um i was gonna say there's a. Uh, I think that's everything we're all done thank you very much everybody for watching i've enjoyed that some uh some very good points don't don't scratch me cat and there was something else i was gonna say as well and i can't remember what it was we i know we're gonna be back um on it's going to be uh, early hours of Saturday morning or late Friday night in North America. Stan is hopefully joining me to do a preview show for the Brentford game. And then me and Deke will be live about 10 minutes after the Brentford game, five minutes, 10 minutes, depending how it goes. And then, uh, yes, we'll be back also sometime next week to talk about the magnificent win against uh, against Brentford, making it eight wins in a row. It'd be fantastic. And uh, my favourite tweet of the week, it's not a new segment. It was um, Man United and Chelsea fans both talking to each other on Twitter and they went, look at Arsenal. This is the banter era and they've left us behind. They were <laughs> sad that, that we should have been with them for the banter era. We've moved on. The, the future is bright. And it's uh, it's a great time to be a gooner. So thank you very much, Josh. It's lovely to have you back, the Dark Prince of Twitter. <laughs> thank you very much. I mean, I'm not much much of a tweeter anymore, but uh, no. occasionally I'll do one. Not since the incident. You did one the other day and it blew up. Apparently that's what the Utes say. Yeah, I did. I went viral on X, whatever that means now. Now that's you need to go and lick your plant and that'll make you better. Richard, as always, thank you very much of your wise words. Thank you for having me on, Danny. I'd just like to just, sorry, to hijack Tuesday and just say uh, a big well done to my daughter, Amy, who's, um, uh, whose uh, appearance and, and uh, on Horrible Histories got aired this week. She had a speaking role, her first ever speaking role on TV. So well done, Amy. I'm very That's proud of you. Amazing.
And is she going around calling everybody darling and sweetie now? <laughs> not yet, not yet. That's not next week when she uh, she's in, in the next episode. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. Uh, and finally, Melvin, back to back shows. Thank you very much. Lovely to have you on. And uh, you got a very you got a wonderful insight on football that some of these rapscallions have no idea, right? Because they 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 weren't even thought of when you were a regular at the mighty Arsenal, were they? No, well, that might be true, but thanks very, very much. I really do enjoy coming on this one. Thank you. Good. Lovely. Right, people, that's it. Um, come back for the, all the other shows. It'd be lovely if there were 600 people watching that, but I've got a feeling there will be about 12 of you and uh, you'll just be being mean to us. So here's a shitty outro from last season because I'm too late. No, it's not. It's Steve and Dave. Just we invite me on next time, Danny. Yeah, we'll I think back. that's what it is. <laughs> they, they can't believe you're back. Exactly. Don't call it a comeback. Um, Wonderful words. Right, everybody. Thank you much. Goodbye. As soon as I scored that goal, I was fucking livid. Get down, dog. Splendid business. He nearly caught the bloody thing. What are you talking about? <laughs> so I've just eaten a full quiche. Well, you don't often see him at him. So when you see him in the supermarket, they need to be swagged, microwaved immediately, and get the brown sauce on one. Bosh, Bob's your uncle. Never in doubt.